when you are introduced to the Lagrangian mechanics for the first time, there are a lot of questions that arise in your mind. Why is it equivalent to Newtonian mechanics? Do particles know where they are going before they start moving? Why does it work at all? And so on. Each of them is a good question on their own, but we are going to focus on one slightly simpler issue. Accepting the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics as a given, is there a deep reason or physical explanation of why the Lagrangian has the form it has? That is, kinetic energy minus potential energy. Can we actually derive this formula? And does it have a physical meaning? Or is it just a mathematical tool we use to derive the laws of motion? Of course, to answer these questions, we would need to make some assumptions. And the starting point for us is going to be the notion of space and time symmetries. So, here are prerequisites. I assume that you know Newtonian mechanics and you are somewhat familiar with the principle of stationary action itself. So we are not going to discuss it in detail, only briefly. I also assume you know multivariable real calculus and linear algebra pretty well. Let's start with the principle of stationary action. We will formulate it for the case of the point particle moving in R3 first. So, we have a particle that moves between two fixed points along some path R. And by path, we mean just a smooth map from R to R3. Some forces might act on a particle or not. We don't know yet. We are trying to consider the most general case. And since we don't know the forces, we don't know the exact path the particle is traveling. That's what we want to figure out. First, we define the following integral. It's called the action. Here, we integrate along a path R. And L, the Lagrangian, is a smooth function of coordinates, velocities, and time. It characterizes our mechanical system. Mathematically speaking, action is a functional. That is, it's a function that depends on other functions. In our case, for a given Lagrangian, it takes a path in R3 as input and gives some real number as output. The principle of stationary action states the following. Among all the possible paths between the points 1 and 2, the particle moves along the one that makes the action stationary. That is, the variation of S on such path is zero. And variation is nothing more than the notion of the differential, but for the functionals. So, when we say that the variation of S is zero for some path R, that means that if we slightly change the path R, then the corresponding change in the action is smaller in order than the change in R. Indeed, the change in action is just the variation of S plus the term that's smaller in order than dr. And since variation is equal to zero, we've left with just O of dr. To gain a better understanding of this, you can compare it to the analogous statements about functions on R. Stationary action principle is a global statement about the mechanical system, but we can derive the local conclusions from it too. These are the Euler-Lagrange equations. So, if a path makes action stationary, it also must satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equations. Let's examine these equations more closely. Vector derivatives here are just a way to make the equations look more compact. We could use indices instead, or even write down all three equations explicitly, but we will make use of this vector notation later. So, we have a system of second-order differential equations, and the solution would require initial conditions. This solution gives us the equations of motion for our system, that is, some function r of time, initial coordinates, and initial velocities. This is where we're transitioning to talking more about physics. So, the physical claim is the following. Define the function L as kinetic energy minus potential energy. Then, the Euler-Lagrange equations are sufficient to reproduce all the results of Newtonian mechanics. In fact, you can see the Euler-Lagrange equations as a fancy way of writing down Newton's second law. Indeed, let's look at our case of a particle moving in Euclidean space. The derivative of L, with respect to velocity, gives us a momentum of a particle. And the derivative of L, with respect to position vector, gives us the force 
that's acting on a particle. So, as a result, we obtain Newton's second law. We focused only on a simple example of a point particle, but Lagrangian mechanics, of course, makes more general claims. That is, for a large class of mechanical systems, Lagrangian formulation gives us a picture that is equivalent to Newtonian mechanics. The only caveat is we would need to give more precise definitions for the notions of kinetic and potential energy in this case. We would also talk about generalized coordinates instead of just coordinates, generalized velocities instead of velocities, generalized forces instead of forces, generalized momenta instead of momenta, etc. And if we took all these details into consideration, the Euler-Lagrange equations would give us the laws of motion for our mechanical system. But why does the Lagrangian of classical mechanics have the form it has? Well, to answer this question, we would need first to talk about general properties of Lagrangians. Let's consider two systems, A and B. And let's say, these systems do not influence each other. Mathematically, this means that the Lagrangian of the system A doesn't depend on the quantities of the system B. And the Lagrangian of the system B doesn't depend on the quantities of the system A. Physically, we can say that systems A and B do not interact. For example, they are at a large distance from each other. But what if we want to consider a system that consists of A and B as its subsystems? What would be the correct form of the Lagrangian for such system? Well, if we look at the Euler-Lagrange equations, it's not hard to see that the answer is LA plus LB. Indeed, the coordinates of such system are just coordinates of systems A and B combined. And the Euler-Lagrange equations would then give us the laws of motion for two non-interacting subsystems A and B. Let us also note that the multiplication of the Lagrangian by an arbitrary constant doesn't change the equations of motion. Once again, it's enough to look at the Euler-Lagrange equations to understand why it is the case. Although, this property is significantly constrained if we take into account the property of additivity. Yes, we can multiply Lagrangians by arbitrary constants, but only if we multiply all the Lagrangian at once and by the same constant. Physically, this corresponds to the choice of units of measure. And last, but not least, if we add to the Lagrangian a total derivative of an arbitrary function of coordinates in time, then the equations of motion won't change. To prove this statement, let's write down the action that corresponds to the new Lagrangian. The first term gives us the old action. And for the second term, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we obtain this. The difference between the values of f at the points 1 and 2. And since this is a constant, its variation is equal to 0, analogous to how the differential of a constant function is also 0. So, varying the action for both cases will produce the same result. Thus, the Lagrangian is defined only up to a total time derivative of an arbitrary function of coordinates in time. As you know, Newtonian mechanics postulates the existence of a special class of reference frames in which free bodies move uniformly along straight lines. These are so-called inertial frames of reference. In such frames, the laws of physics have the simplest possible form. If we would consider an arbitrary frame of reference instead, and we wanted to write down, for example, Newton's second law, it might contain additional terms, so-called fictitious forces, which would make the description of the system more complicated. And free bodies in such frames would no longer move uniformly along straight lines, even though there were no real forces acting on them. So, from a Newtonian perspective, what makes inertial frames privileged is exactly the absence of these fictitious forces. Let's consider a motion described by the following equation in some inertial frame k. And let another frame k prime move with a constant velocity v relative to k. 
then the description of the same motion, in these two frames, will be related by the following formula. Here, big R, is a vector, that gives the position of the origin of k prime, in the frame k. And it's equal to big V, multiplied by T. If we differentiate this relation with respect to T, and assume that the time in both frames is the same, then for velocities, we get the following. So, velocities in k and k prime obey the usual vector addition rules. By differentiating with respect to t one more time, we obtain a relation between the accelerations, which are now equal. This implies that Newton's laws in k and k prime have the same form. Thus, k prime is an inertial frame too. So, a frame that moves with a constant velocity relative to an inertial frame is also inertial. This implies that there's an infinite number of inertial frames moving with constant velocities relative to each other, with none of them being privileged in any way. And the laws of motion in them have the same form. The crucial assumption that we made was the existence of the universal time that is the same for all observers. It is precisely this assumption that specifies the rules of transformations between different inertial frames. This is the essence of the Galilean relativity. Introducing the notion of inertial frames as above is a perfectly reasonable and standard way of laying down the foundations of classical mechanics. However, there's another, more geometric way of postulating the same experimental facts. Instead of talking about how free bodies move in inertial frames, Let's focus on what this motion tells us about the geometry of space and time. So, here are postulates. Newtonian spacetime, which serves as a background for classical mechanics, is a direct product of E and E3. Where E is a Euclidean line that represents time, and E3 is a three-dimensional Euclidean space. Let's examine their properties more closely. First of all, E3 is not just a linear space, it's a fine. Meaning, it doesn't have a special point zero, so all points of E3 are equivalent. Physically, this corresponds to the fact that it doesn't matter where do you put the origin of your reference frame, or to the fact that the laws of mechanics should have the same form everywhere. Secondly, when we say E3 is Euclidean, what we mean by that is that it has a standard Euclidean metric which allows us to talk about distances and angles. Another property of E3 is that it has no preferred direction. So, it doesn't matter how do you orient the axis of your reference frame. Or, the laws of mechanics should hold the same form in different directions. Next, let's talk about the timeline. Just like E3, it's also fine, so, it has no fixed origin too. And, as you can guess, it corresponds to the fact that it doesn't matter which moment of time you choose as your t equals zero. Or, the laws of mechanics should have the same form at different moments in time. Next, the fact that Newtonian spacetime is not just E4, and we are considering the pair E and E3 instead, corresponds to the notion of universal time we've talked about. So, we should think of Newtonian spacetime as a sequence of spatial slices along the universal timeline, where each particular slice is a Euclidean space E3, and every observer in it shares the same notion of time. And one small detail, both E and E3 have fixed orientations. In the case of time, this specifies the difference between the past and the future. And in the case of space, the difference between left-handed and right-handed frames. The properties of Newtonian spacetime, discussed above, can be also viewed through the lens of symmetry. And by symmetry, we mean such transformations of spacetime that leave the Newtonian structure intact. That is, after the transformation, spacetime is still a direct product of E and E3, and their properties haven't changed. For example, the property of homogeneity of space corresponds to the symmetry under spatial translations. The property of isotopy of space to the spatial rotations.
and homogeneity of time to the time translations. There is, however, one more symmetry that we should add here. And that's the symmetry associated with moving from one inertial frame to another. These are so-called Galilean boosts. And they correspond to the property of Galilean relativity that we considered before. So, we have three types of spatial translations, three types of spatial rotations, one type of time translations, and three types of Galilean boosts. Together, they form a 10-dimensional symmetry group of Newtonian spacetime. This is so-called Galilei group. Finally, we are ready to talk about the Lagrangian of classical mechanics. Let's consider first the motion of a free particle in an inertial frame of reference. We've concluded that the laws of motion must satisfy the symmetries of the Galilei group. But if we just look at the Euler-Lagrange equations, then the most obvious way to achieve this is to demand the Lagrangian to obey these symmetries too. We know that in the most general case, the Lagrangian of a system depends on coordinates, velocities, and time. But the homogeneity of space and time implies that the Lagrangian cannot explicitly contain neither coordinates nor time. The sotropy of space, on the other hand, implies that the Lagrangian cannot depend on the direction of velocity, only on its absolute value. And we will lose no generality by assuming that the Lagrangian is a function of v squared instead. This won't change the final result, but it will make things easier for us, since we can write down v squared as a dot product of v with itself. So, we can conclude that the Lagrangian of a free particle is some functionale of v squared. And, to discover the exact form of this dependence, we will use the remaining symmetry of the Galilei group. So, let's consider an inertial frame k prime that is moving with a small velocity epsilon relative to frame k. We demand Lagrangian of our system to hold the same form in both of these frames. Mathematically, this means that if L is some function of the squared velocity in K, then L prime should be the same function, but of the squared velocity in K prime. Next, let's consider L prime and replace V prime by V minus epsilon. Let's expand this expression and change the sign. We could look at the argument of L as a sum of some variable x and a small term h. So, let's write down the Taylor expansion of L as a function of v squared. First, we have the value of our function at the point x, that is, L of v squared. Next, we have the derivative of our function with respect to x. In our case, that is the derivative of L with respect to v squared. All that should be multiplied by h. And in our case, that is epsilon squared minus 2v epsilon. And the rest are the terms that are smaller in order than h. Or, in our case, we can write them down as the terms that are smaller in order than epsilon for simplicity. Now, the term with epsilon squared is also smaller in order than epsilon, so we can get rid of it. Also, since this is physics, and epsilon is small, we close our eyes, and pretend that higher order terms don't exist. Thus, we've left with the following expression. So, the Lagrangian in the frame k prime, is the sum, of the Lagrangian in the frame k, and, some additional term. But on the other hand, we know that L prime, could differ from L, only by a total time derivative, of an arbitrary function, of time and coordinates. From this, we conclude that these differences should be equal. And let's write down explicitly what we mean by the total time derivative. Changing dr by dt to v, we obtain this. We can see 
that the total derivative depends on the only linearly, since df by dr and df by dt don't contain v in any form. And since the left-hand side of our equation already have v, we can conclude that dl by dv squared doesn't depend on v. Otherwise, on the right side, we would have a linear function of v, and on the left side, a nonlinear function of v. So, dl by dv squared is constant, and the general solution for this equation is the following function, where alpha and beta are two constants. And again, since adding a total time derivative to the Lagrangian doesn't change the equations of motion, we can choose beta to be zero. This term doesn't matter. As to alpha, we denote this constant as m divided by 2 instead. And actually, we can use it as a definition of mass in classical mechanics. However, we should make two important remarks here. First, if you remember, the equations of motion also stay invariant if you multiply the Lagrangian by an arbitrary constant. So the constant m is also arbitrary. But if we take into account the additive property of the Lagrangian, this arbitrariness corresponds to the choice of the units of measure. So, what matters is not the absolute values of different masses, but the ratios between them. Next, let's assume that the principle of the stationary action for our system is actually the principle of least action. That is, in order to find the right equations of motion, we should minimize the action and not just make it stationary. And let's assume that m is negative. Observe that in this case, action is not bounded from below. Indeed, if m is negative, then l is negative, and we can make it arbitrary negative simply by choosing paths with larger and larger velocities, so the action wouldn't have a minimum. Thus, we can exclude the case of negative mass as unphysical. However, we should note, although this reasoning works for the vast majority of mechanical systems, since they mostly obey the principle of least action, there are some important exceptions where the principle of stationary action is at play. So, in the most general case, we actually can exclude the negative values of m. So, we've considered the motion of a free particle in the inertial frames k and k prime, where k prime was moving with a small velocity epsilon relative to k. And, using the Galilean relativity, we've derived the following formula for the Lagrangian. Let k prime move with an arbitrary velocity v now, not necessarily small. But, since the velocity v can be represented as a sum of small velocities epsilon n, all the reasoning from previous sections works without change, and the Lagrangian in frame k prime would have the same form as in k. Indeed, replacing v prime by v minus big v, and expanding this expression, we obtain the following with the second term is the total time derivative of a function of coordinates in time. So, in conclusion, this form of the Lagrangian obeys all the symmetries of the Galilei group. In order to obtain the Lagrangian of a system of free non-interacting particles, we should just remember the property of additivity. So, the Lagrangian is equal to the following sum. Here, index A specifies a particle. Next, let's consider a closed system of two interacting particles. And by closed, we mean that particles interact only with each other and no other bodies. The simplest way to include this interaction in our description is to add a term to the Lagrangian that would be responsible for it. So, we would have the Lagrangian of the first particle plus the Lagrangian of the second particle plus the Lagrangian of their interactions. Dimensional analysis tells us that this term should have the same units as LA and LB. And just like the whole Lagrangian of the system, it could, in principle, depend only on coordinates, velocities, and time. Now, we can, in fact, exclude the dependence on time on the basis of time translational symmetry. Indeed, time-dependent interactions would imply that our system is not actually closed. 
the symmetries of space, on the other hand, imply that interactions can only depend on relative distances and velocities between the particles. But other than that, we can't say much about the term element without specifying the nature of interactions. So from here, we are now will be borrowing terms and conclusions from Newtonian mechanics. As you can guess, the part of the Lagrangian, related to the free motion, is called the kinetic energy. And, if we take the term, related to interactions, with a minus sign in front of it, we get the potential energy. We can generalize these results, for an arbitrary number of interacting particles. Indeed, the Lagrangian would contain kinetic energies of all particles, plus, the term that describes the interactions. And as before, it only depends on relative coordinates and velocities. In some cases, the expression for potential energy can be simplified. For example, if the interactions are pairwise, and the forces that carry out the interactions are conservative, then we have the following formula. Of course, the reasoning for introducing the potential energy that we provided above is not a derivation in any way. Indeed, we've just borrowed the notion from Newtonian mechanics on the basis of reproducing the same results. So we should look at it not as a proof, but as a formalization of known experimental facts. So far, we've talked about systems of particles, but as you probably already know, the Lagrangian description works for many other mechanical systems too. As we've mentioned before, we would need to talk about generalized coordinates instead, in such cases, but the general idea stays the same. We have the action, and we need to make it stationary. The Lagrangian is still kinetic energy, minus potential energy, as before. But what exactly is meant by these notions, would depend on a particular mechanical system. So, let's consider a closed system, that consists of two interacting subsystems, A and B. Then, if we denote the generalized coordinates of systems A and B, by QA, and QB, the Lagrangian, can be written, as a sum, of the following terms. Kinetic energy of A, kinetic energy of B, and minus potential energy of their interactions. Note, that for kinetic energy, we have now dependence on coordinates too, which is, in fact, the most general case. And let's assume that we actually know the motion of the subsystem B, that is, some function QB of time. If we now replace the coordinates QB and velocities Q dot B in the Lagrangian, by this given function and its derivative, then we'll obtain the following. Kinetic energy of the subsystem B is now some function of time and can be represented as a total time derivative. Thus, we can ignore it. The potential energy, on the other hand, now depends only on the coordinates and velocities of the subsystem A and time. So, the Lagrangian now depends only on the quantities characterizing the subsystem A. Then, instead of talking about a closed system consisting of subsystems A and B, we can talk about an open system A in the external field B. Thus, open systems can be described using the same methods we've used for describing closed systems. The only difference is that the potential energy may now explicitly depend on time. For example, if we have a point particle moving in a conservative field, the Lagrangian is given by the following formula. Summing up, we postulated the principle of stationary action, talk about general properties of Lagrangians. Then, building on the notion of inertial frames of reference, we introduced the concept of Newtonian spacetime. And, taking into account the symmetries of the spacetime, we've derived the Lagrangian of a free particle. Using this insight, we've considered other, less trivial, mechanical systems. And, partly based on the general considerations, partly, on the concepts from Newtonian mechanics, we've come to the general form of the Lagrangian. So, can you derive the Lagrangian of classical mechanics? The answer is, somewhat yes, but not really. You see, when trying to describe certain physical phenomena, it's often the case that there is more than one way of doing that. That is, there is more than one mathematical model that fits the known experimental facts. In the case of classical mechanics, that's particularly true.
we can describe the same phenomena using the language of Newtonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics or symplectic geometry, etc. Some of these descriptions can be preferred when talking about a specific phenomenon. Sometimes, a particular language makes the description way more simpler or even provides some insight that was hidden in other descriptions. In the case of Lagrangian mechanics, for example, we can say that the system evolves along the path that minimizes transfers between kinetic and potential energies. But no matter which theory you chose to use, there will always be the question about its foundations. In the case of Newtonian mechanics, that's Newton's laws of motion. And in the case of Lagrange, that's the principle of stationary action and the form of the Lagrangian. You can, in fact, derive one from another, but at the end of the day, you always would need to start somewhere. So the foundations of any theory are just a way of axiomatizing known experimental facts. Then you should look at the formula L equals T minus V as one of those foundations. And the reasoning is blatantly simple. It works. Lagrangians are just the tools we use to derive the correct laws of physics. And in the domain of classical mechanics, this particular form does the job pretty well. But maybe, one day, we would have a better answer than this. Hope that helped.